We are in a new biology chapter, chapter 19. So we just wrapped up our survey of all of the different kingdoms of living organisms. We looked at bacteria, we looked at protists, and fungi, and plants, and then animals. And that's where we were most recently. So we have one chapter that looks at aspects of how living organisms interact with each other and the impact of changes to what's going on with living organisms. And then we move on to human anatomy and physiology. So this is chapter 19, ecology, and in particular, 19a, the ecosystem. So first, just a little bit about ecology. A few terms. Ecology we have as the science of the relationships between an organism and its environment. So it's not just the relationships between different types of organisms, but organisms and their environment, whether it be organisms and other organisms or organisms and non-living things. The ecosystem we can define as the total system of interactions between living organisms and non-living things and factors within a limited area. So it's the limited area and how all the different living and non-living things are interacting with each other. And before we look at that case study, let's do video question number three. Video question number three, what do you call someone who studies ecology? And the answer is ecologist, ecologist. So number three, what do you call someone who studies ecology? Answer, ecologist. Okay, so uh, a good example of why ecology can be important. Rabbits in Australia. So here's what happened. In 1859, a guy named Thomas Austin imported 24 rabbits from England and released them onto his estate for hunting. He really liked rabbit hunting. He's like, ah, there are no rabbits that are indigenous to Australia. I just want to do some rabbit hunting on my property. So he imported 24 rabbits. Well, fast forward about six years. His estate had over 10,000 rabbits, even though he had killed over 20,000. So the 24 rabbits over the course of six years had become at least 30,000 rabbits. Then, in the 1900s, the rabbits had spread over 1,000 miles from the farm and had invaded all major grazing areas of Australia. And so what did, the, what did Australia do to try to contain them? Well, let's see. So first, the Australian government paid people to kill the rabbits. And they killed them in large numbers. Here's one picture of one person with the rabbits that he had captured. And um, yeah, they would get paid for killing the rabbits because Australia was trying to get rid of them. Next bullet point there, they poisoned the rabbits' food supply. They're like, well, we've, we're hiring people to kill as many of them as we can, and this is still getting out of control. What if we try to poison the rabbits' water? And they would do that, but it still wasn't containing the rabbits. They put up a roughly 2,000-mile-long fence. And here's a picture. You uh, have a little bit of the fence there on the right. And then on the left, some information about the fence. I'm not going to take the time to read all that. But yeah, I mean, ugh, toward the top right of that sign, the cost. The total cost of three fences with a massive was a massive, just about 340,000 pounds. Uh, pounds, that'd be Australian pounds, if we assume it's kind of similar to, whatchamacallit, to British pounds. We can, depending on when this was done, roughly double it to get the number of dollars. So that's actually, I know, $700,000. It's actually not as bad as I would have guessed, but I, it is just kind of like a barbed wire, well, chicken wire fence, basically, but yeah. So they put up a huge fence. Uh, next, they imported hawks, snakes, and weasels, because what they realized was going on is there was no natural predator to rabbits in Australia. So the rabbits, as long as there was food available, they just, they could eat and reproduce, and there was more land available where there was more food, more land, more food, and there were no animals there that were killing them. So they thought, well, let's bring in some animals that kill rabbits. We'll bring in hawks, we'll bring in snakes, we'll bring in weasels. And it helped a bit, but there were other things that were going on with the hawks, snakes, and weasels that kept them. There was one thing that they brought in 
where I don't remember what it was, but one other kind of organism, you know, animal that they brought in to try to deal with it. And in hindsight, they're like, oh, we're so glad that didn't work because if that animal, there's no natural predator of that animal, if that animal had gone crazy in, in growing numbers like the rabbits, that would have been a problem. And then the last sub-bullet under efforts, efforts to contain is they released rabbits infected with a deadly virus. They found a virus that is very deadly just to rabbits, and they released rabbits who were infected with that virus into the rabbit populations, and they saw some success with that as well. Uh, and I think that's something that they are still doing, but what was happening was it it still wasn't quite dealing with the problem as well as they thought. And after further study, what they realized was happening was the virus is transmitted from rabbit to rabbit by mosquitoes. And the mosquitoes need still water, you know, like ponds, pools of water, not like swimming pool kind of water, but, you know, pools of water in order to reproduce. And some of these rabbits were living in areas that were just dry enough that there was not standing water for the mosquitoes to reproduce. And so those areas were not being affected by the virus. Only the areas where there was standing water were getting affected by the virus because the mosquitoes that carry the virus could reproduce there. It was around 1920 that the rabbit population peaked around 10 billion rabbits in Australia. And it's a lot more under control now. Uh, let's see. So 200 million would be one-fifth of one billion. So it's about one-fiftieth of what it was in just 100 years ago, uh, being around 200 million now. Yep. One other example that I could give is that something that's still going on today as well is there were some brown tree snakes that were imported into Guam in order to be pets, and uh, some of them were released, and similar kind of a thing. There are no natural predators for these brown tree snakes in Guam, and so these tree snakes reproduced and reproduced and reproduced, and there just came to be tons of them. I think I read at one point something like, something like, is it 2,000 or 20,000 of these tree snakes per square mile of forested area? Something like that. And yeah, similar problem of growing out of control. And uh, it's pretty interesting the way that those have been dealt with, at least one of the affected means. Some of it is bringing in other organisms that can act as predators, but they have to be really careful about which one, what they bring in. And But they found that this species of tree snake is very, very, very susceptible to Tylenol, also known as acetaminophen that the compound acetaminophen, a.k.a. Tylenol, is very poisonous to these snakes. So what they do periodically uh, is they get a whole bunch of mice, dead mice, and they inject these dead mice with a little bit of Tylenol, and then they fly over the forest where the brown tree snakes are, and they release the dead mice with little parachutes, so the dead mice parachute down into the forest. The parachute gets caught in a tree branch somewhere, leaving the dead mouse hanging in such a way that the brown tree snakes can find and eat the mice. And then the Tylenol poisons the snake and the snake dies. But the amount of Tylenol is not deadly to any of the other animals in the area, so they don't have to worry about other animals being killed by the Tylenol, just the brown tree snakes. So it's a pretty creative solution. And that relates to number... Number one. Video question number one. To help control the brown tree snake population in Guam, they parachute dead mice injected with what? And the answer is Tylenol. T Y L E. N-O-L, Tylenol, video question number one. All right, so what are some things that ecologists do? Well, they study the relationships between existing organisms and their environment. So how, does, how do these organisms who are already here relate to their surroundings and what, what's the nature of those relationships? 
Second bullet point, they predict what would happen if some factor were changed. So if this organism were removed, how would that affect? If a new organism were added, how would that affect? If this, if this river were removed from this area, how would that affect things? Stuff like that. And then the third bullet point, they recommend steps to change an environment or the organisms in it. Uh, so we, for example, when we watched the video that included stuff about amphibians, there was a Japanese giant salamander and some of the hydroelectric dams. I think they were, no, they weren't hydroelectric dams. Maybe they were. I don't know. Anyway, some of the dams and rivers were preventing the, uh, the salamanders from crawling and slash swimming upstream to get back to their Greek breeding grounds. And so ecologists uh, played a role in helping them figure out what's a way that they can still kind of accomplish what they're wanting to accomplish with the dams, but in a different way that allows the Japanese salamanders to get upstream where they're wanting to go. So stuff like that. All right. So a little bit more specifically getting into the ecosystem. Ecosystem is the total system of interactions between living organisms and non-living things and factors within a limited area. And that living and non-living, or rather maybe I should say non-living and living, that takes us to two terms here, the abiotic environment. That is the physical or non-living part of the ecosystem. And what does that include? That includes radiation, such as you know, sunlight, the heat that comes from sunlight, the atmosphere, the rotation of the earth, winds, water, the water in the area, the topography, you know, like is it hilly or rocky or there are giant plateaus or okay, the topography of the area, the soil, logic, the soil and geological substrate, gravity, and fire. And on the topic of winds... I have video question number four. Video question number four. What is an example of how wind can affect an ecosystem? What is an example of how wind can affect an ecosystem? And the answer is tree line. The tree line. So this is as you go up mountains, there gets to an elevation where trees just basically stop growing. And what's going on there is the wind is regularly strong enough that either the seeds for the trees don't land or the young saplings that are starting to grow, the wind is too strong for them and they don't survive. And so that's, that's the tree line. All right, so that's a little bit about the abiotic environment, though the next couple slides go into that a little bit more. And then the biotic community. This is the living organisms in the ecosystem and we have basically two categories. The producers, these are like the green plants and algae, they're the ones that add energy to the situation by doing photosynthesis. And then the consumers, these are things that feed on other living things. So feeders like animals and protists, decomposers like fungi and bacteria. So the next few slides is a little bit more about the biotic, about the abiotic environment, and then a little bit more about the biotic community. Uh, wind effect example, there you go. That's the timber line, or also known as the tree line, timber line or tree line. Uh, the water cycle. So the text goes into the water cycle a bit. And basically what happens is through evaporation and transpiration, water enters the atmosphere. So evaporation would be just water evaporating from lake, river, ocean. Transpiration would be water evaporating out of a plant. So the water evaporates and the water enters the atmosphere. Then that water in the atmosphere, as the warm, moist air rises, it cools and condenses uh, the moisture and a cloud forms. Then as clouds become cooler, the water falls as precipitation. So you either get rain or snow. Uh, and then some of the precipitation forms streams that flow toward lakes and oceans. Some of the water percolates into the soil. Some of the water in the lakes and oceans um, pre, oops, that should say evaporates, not precipitates, evaporates. And some of the water in the soil gets taken up by plants and then transpires, completing the cycle. So that's the water cycle. 
And then fire. Fire is another abiotic thing that can affect a uh, an ecosystem. Sometimes in very very damaging ways. Sometimes in very good ways. And we've had problems with fires in California, but the extent of the problems have oftentimes been because of uh, keeping fires from happening. What happens is, so the normal flow of things, forest fires have been a regular occurrence throughout all of the history of the earth. And what usually happens is lightning strikes and it causes a fire where the fire burns out some of the undergrowth, you know, like smaller plants toward the surface. And that's it. The fire doesn't get big enough to completely destroy the forest, to completely kill off the big trees. And it actually serves a good purpose of, of it's good for the soil, uh, it's good for the competition of the plants for resources, and um, it even is necessary for certain types of trees to release their seeds. But there was a movement for a long time of saying, oh no, we must keep all of these fires from happening. So as soon as one happened, put it out. Another one happened, put it out. Another one happened, put it out. What was happening is the undergrowth was getting more and more and more and more. And now if some spark or negligent or just bad person or lightning creates a fire now the undergrowth is too much and the fire gets big enough that it not only destroys the undergrowth it also destroys the whole area and you have a huge problem all right now a little bit about the biotic community there are uh, different levels that we have going on here so if we're looking at one organism that's an individual then the next step up from there is population. That would be you're looking at the same species usually. So you have a population of organisms from one particular species. And then a community, that would be a variety of populations in an area. And then up from a, but still relatively small. And then up from a community would be an entire ecosystem. And then up from an entire ecosystem would be a biome, which in this case is biome is like all of what well, it's kind of like mid to northern Canada and a bunch of Alaska. So we're talking a huge area here where this one giant biome would be made up of multiple ecosystems where each ecosystem has different communities in it. And each community is made up of multiple populations and each population has a bunch of individuals. Okay. And then up from biome, you include all of the biomes together and you have the entire biosphere. Okay. And biotic community is made up of producers and consumers. Producers, organisms that manufacture their own food. And then consumers, animals, protozoans, fungi, most bacteria, and humans, which consume all or part of other organisms for food. And then the food chain. So this is uh, really kind of make more sense going from bottom to top, but just in order at the bottom of the food chain, you have the primary consumers. These are usually herbivores. They are the things that, that eat producers. Okay? Then a secondary consumer, also known as a first-level carnivore, it is a consumer that eats primary consumers. So a primary consumer might be something like a sheep that eats grass. And then a secondary consumer would be like a wolf that eats the sheep that eats grass. And then tertiary consumers, a.k.a. second-level carnivores, they are meat eaters that eat the secondary consumers who eat the primary consumers who eat the producers. Okay. Now, each step along the way, you lose about 80 to 90% of the energy that was originally trapped from, or, you know, was, orig was originally used from sunlight and converted into usable energy. So, like, grass, you know, creates, a, uh, creates quote, unquote, a bunch of energy from sunlight, really, you know, changes the form of the energy from being light energy to being chemical energy. Uh, in the ATP. And then the if we're talking like sheep eating grass, when the sheep eat the grass, about 80 to 90% of that energy that was there is, or is lost. And so the sheep only gets about 20% of what could have been there. 
All right, oh, and all of the different molecules and chemicals. You, you might be like, well, Mr. French, I thought in the last video you said that cows and stuff like that get like 80, 60%, yeah, get like 60% of the energy out of cellulose. Well, that's just cellulose in the plant. There's a lot of other molecules there as well. Uh, and then if a wolf eats a sheep, then the wolf only gets about 20% of the energy that was totally available in all the molecules of the sheep, etc. All right, then there are things called ecological pyramids, and there are different ways of showing kind of what's going on in an uh, ecosystem. First, there's an energy period, and this pyramid, and this relates to what we were just talking about, where what we have is we have sun's energy shining here, and that energy is used to create, uh, you know, chemical energy. So this would be like in the grass. And then, so the, the, it, this represents the 100% of energy available in the ecosystem. Then the primary consumers only end up with about 10% of that. And the secondary consumers only end up with about 10% of that, which takes you down to 1%. Then the third level consumers only end up with about 10% of that, which takes you down to about 0.1%, etc. And then each step along the way, you have decomposers who are breaking materials down, which releases energy and nutrients back that is available for the primary consumers to take up. And then you also have uh, some of the energy that's getting lost as peat. So that's an energy pyramid. This one is a pyramid of numbers, where what usually happens is at the bottom, the, the producers, you have the most number of individuals. So this would be like some grass, and you have like 5.8 million grass, um, whatchamacallit, 5.8 million grass organisms. And then the consumers eat the grass. Here you have like 700,000 of those. And then the secondary consumers that eat the primary consumers, you have about, oh no, what is with that number? There should be a comma there. <laughs> There's a three comma, five, four comma. Yeah, you have about 350,000 of those. And then the tertiary consumers that eat the primary consumers, you only have about three of those. And then, as you might expect, the sheer quantity of numbers here means that there's a lot of mass. Even though each individual organism is a lot smaller, there's a lot of mass there. And so this is the third kind of pyramid, a pyramid of biomass, where here the producers, you have about a 1,000 kilograms of mass in this particular ecosystem. And then the herbivores, uh, the primary consumers, they you have about 1,000 kilograms and then the primary carnivore, also known as the secondary consumers, you have about 10 kilograms, and then at the top, you only have about one kilogram of mass. All right. And food webs. Food webs are a way of looking at an ecosystem in terms of which organisms consume which other organisms. And so here, if an area goes from one thing to another, it means that the arrow is pointing to the organism that eats the thing that is getting eaten. All right, so here, for example, the air is going from a cactus to a grasshopper, and that means the grasshopper eats the, eats the cactus. But the grasshopper is eat... Oh, let's see, what else eats the cactus? Well, the arrow goes from the cactus to bacteria. So bacteria and grasshopper consume the, the cactus. But then what consumes the grasshopper? Well, let's see. Lizard eats grasshopper, and bacteria eats grass, eats, quote-unquote, you know, feeds on or decomposes. How about, is there anything else that the grasshopper eats? Well, the grasshopper also eats grass, because the arrow goes from grass to grasshopper, and the grasshopper eats star cactus, because the arrow goes from star cactus to grasshopper. Uh, then how about this tarantula? The tarantula eats the kangaroo rat, the tarantula is eaten by rattlesnake, and the tarantula is eaten by... Ba Notice all of the arrows point to bacteria. In other words, every organism has an arrow that points from it to bacteria, because bacteria help decompose everything. How about rabbit? Well, let's see. Rabbit eats star cactus, and rabbit eats grass. Rabbit is eaten by hawk, and rabbit is eaten by rattlesnake. 
All right, so stuff like that. And a similar one here, butterfly. Butterfly eats lavender and a flowering plant. The butterfly is eaten by a frog and a dragonfly. All right, so food webs. As you can imagine, they can get pretty complicated for some ecosystems. And then finally, some of the ways that different species interact with each other. There is neutralism, where there's no direct relationship between the organisms. They exist in the same ecosystem, but they don't affect each other one way or the other. They're just neutral toward each other. But then sometimes there's competition, where two populations inhibit each other because they depend upon the same limited resource. So that might be you know, if there's a particular type of fruit that grows on a plant and there are two different organisms that rely on that for their primary food source in that area, there's competition for that limited resource. Then there's predation. One organism eats another organism. Okay, That would be like a lion preying on a gazelle. Okay? Lion eats gazelle, predation. As you can imagine, the gazelle is the loser in that, and the, the gazelle uh, is harmed, and the lion benefits from that relationship. There's immensalism, where one population is inhibited or harmed by a second population, and the second population is not affected by the first. So an example of that would be like if you have... Um, Let's say you have like a herd of elephants. Is it called a herd? A pride of elephants? A pride of elephants. I think it's a pride. Then um, the and they are trampling on a bunch of grass, but they don't eat the grass. So as far as the elephants are concerned, they're not harmed or nor do they benefit by the grass if the grass lives or dies. But the grass is harmed by the elephants living there and being around there because the elephants are killing the grass. All right. So that's video question number five. Video question number five. What is an example of immensalism? And we could say elephants trampling grass. Elephants trampling grass. And parasitism. The parasite depends upon a host. There are endoparasites that live inside of the organism, and there are ectoparasites that live outside or attach onto the organism. Uh, commensalism. This is where one population benefits from a second population, and the second population is not helped or harmed by the first. So immensalism and commensalism are basically the same in that one organism, or very similar, I should say, and that one organism is like, meh, it's not affected or harmed. It, it's, it's not, it doesn't benefit, nor is it harmed. It's just unaffected by a second. But in immensalism, the second organism is harmed, whereas in commensalism, the second organism benefits. So one example I could give for that is there's a type of fish that hangs around near sharks. The sharks don't care that there's a species of fish around. They are not affected by it. The species of fish does not harm the shark. It doesn't help the shark. It doesn't benefit the shark. It just The sharks don't care. But when the sharks feed, it releases small bits of food, of whatever the sharks are feeding on, and these other fish eat that. So the other fish benefit. Or another example I could give is something called the, where is it? Hold on a second. Something called the uh, cattle egret. It's a species of bird, cattle egret. And these birds hang around near where cattle are eating. And what happens is the cattle get a mouthful of grass and rip it up from the ground in order to eat the grass. And when the cattle rips the grass up from the ground, it oftentimes unearths some worms or other insects. Where the, So the egret hangs out right next to where the cattle is eating. The cattle are like, eh, I don't care if you're here. You're maybe sometimes annoying, but oh well, who cares? The cattle eat some grass, and then the egret spots insects 
or worms that are unearthed by the cattle, and the egret are able to get their food source a lot easier that way. And that is video question number two. Video question number two. What is an example of commensalism? And the answer is cattle egrets. So cattle, C-A-T-T-L-E. And the new word, egrets, spelled E-G-R-E-T-S, egrets, cattle egrets. Okay? And then mutualism, where both populations benefit from the relationship. Uh, so mutualism could be something like the bacteria that live in your digestive tract. The bacteria get a food source, you get enhanced digestion. You, uh, or it might be something like their variety of species, whether it be like crocodiles or different types of, of ungulates that have different bird species that live on them, where the bird species eat insects off of the cattle or like out of the crocodile's mouth, where the bird benefits because it gets food, the animal benefits because insects that would be either annoying or would harm the animal are getting eaten, and thus they're helped out like that. So a variety of things that demonstrate mutualism. And that is our brief look at chapter 19a. Yep, that's it. So we'll see you next time with chapter 19b.